images of Puglia and um, that is where one of the wines that we're drinking tonight came from, um, the Primitivo. And we're gonna get into a little bit about Puglia and we're also gonna talk about where um, a lot of Zinfandel is coming out of in California in Lodi. So those are our old world versus new world wines that we're gonna be talking about tonight. And yeah, we're really excited. These are these are some fan favorites and um, these bottles are really tasty. We've we've already indulged a little bit. Just a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we have to do our market research ahead of time. Uh, in the chat channel. Um... We're going to be posting a website um, link that will take you to a tasting wheel for Zinfandel if you're interested. It has a lot of um, a lot of options on it. It might be kind of fun to look at. Feel free to, to open that up in another browser. These tasting wheels are really popular to engage with people and all the myriad of different ways that the Zinfandel can re represent itself across the world. And so it's really interesting with the Zinfandel grape because it is grown in so many different regions, but even the, the soils um, and the climate really impact its flavor. Uh, we'll get into all of that in a little bit. So when you see like a tasting wheel for Zinfandel, it can be really overwhelming. And you could be like, how do, how do they get asparagus? I don't get asparagus on mine. That seems crazy. But what it is is that somewhere uh, there is a specific varietal because of the temperature in the soils and the combinations make this asparagus or whatever type of flavor. <laughs> <clears throat> all right. So I think we're all set up where... We're on the YouTube as well, so everybody that tunes in, uh, hello. Uh, so to kick this off, I am Steven. And hi, I'm Beth. And this is a Veni Vini Amici production. Uh, today we're going to be doing an Old World versus New World with Primitivo Zinfandel. We're going to get into what the differences are. Not too much. And, uh, <laughs> and we're really going to kind of showcase these two grape varietals that maybe you haven't explored that much of and they are such a great uh wine to know more about so you have your tasting wheels hopefully pulled up i see a lot of webcams coming on we are going to be doing some thumbs up some ones and twos and hopefully we can kind of get a little bit of interaction we have the chats all up and uh so let's get this started so here already we have our two maps of the regions that we're looking at so lodi is 90 miles east or yeah east of san francisco in the central valley and uh yeah and then primitivo it's coming from puglia which is in the southern part of italy in the heel of the boot if you will and so we always love to kick off and revisit beautiful pictures uh so you know, with these lectures, we are going to be kind of doing a little bit of talking about and a little bit of background into the region and the grapes. And so feel free to keep drinking. We will have uh, dedicated drinking times, you know, but this is, you can, you can choose Sip your own while invention. you watch. Yes, exactly. absolutely. So these are some images from Puglia. Again, this is the region in the southern part of Italy. Um, in this, it's the part that contains the spur and the heel of the boot. It's uh, relatively flat very sunny and it's known for being a major agricultural producer um besides wine grapes um they also make a, a significant amount of olive oil and a fun fact i read about the olive oil production there some of the um olive trees are over a thousand years thousand old thousand years old which is mind-boggling mind-boggling um but if you ever see an olive tree that is that old you're like yeah no that thing is a thousand years old <laughs> it's it's gnarly and crazy <laughs> but um this is a region that makes a lot of grapes a lot of these are actually going to go on to be um sort of uh, blending grapes in, up, up further north even as far north as france um they do however make um, a number of table wines some of them can be quite rough but they do also make some quality wine in this region as well and um primitivo is one of the varietals that that this but puglia is most known for and primitivo di manduria so we have some pronunciations here for you, Puglia and Primitivo di Manduria. Um, this DOP is one of the more well-known for Primitivo in Puglia. And um, these wines can be a little bit 
rustic from this region, but you can get some really great value wines for, for everyday drinkers. And, um, you know, so it is a, a maritime climate because, I mean, I'm sorry, Mediterranean climate. It is in the Mediterranean Sea. And so one of the things about this specific region that we're going to be exploring today is uh, water, right? It's so it's hot and dry in the in the summertime and the available available water just isn't as relevant or you know, readily available here as it is in other parts of Italy. Um, and so the specific bottle that we have actually uh, has a brand new irrigation system. Uh, and they also do trellising and the trellising will pull the grapes up off of the floor of the ground and it helps give a little bit of a gap so that way it's not so hot at night because the soils will you know retain heat during the day yeah yes um... oh no so, too many buttons <laughs> all right so now we are going to dump it, jump into our first wine and if you don't have the specific wine what we're going to be looking for between this battle of the zins here is did these bottles see oak? How well are the tannins integrated? And the sweetness level and the acidic level, the acid level of this wine. Um, a lot of times people will use a little bit of oak in order to lower that, just make it more round and uh, provide a little bit more full body with this. So everybody, cheers. Cheers. Okay, so our first question, did this see oak? For everybody that's in our webcams here, can we get a, a thumbs up if you thought it sees oak? Or I, I guess just, uh, you know, you could just fist pump. You can fist pump if you want. Okay, so we have, all right, we got we got some people that are saying yes. We have some that are saying no. All Ooh, right. An interesting mix there. Interesting yeah. mix. So this one has seen French oak for eight to 12 months. And so that's actually a really um, great indicator of, for the price point, knowing that it's seen oak um, is really an interesting thing because it costs a lot of money to add that oak. You know, this area isn't as uh, sought after internationally. So people that are producing grapes here are, you know, normally more thin margins, if you will. And so the price point that these specific bottles are at for having a wine that is made with oak is really amazing. Um, so now what is your mouth communicating to you in terms of the alcohol level and the, the acid and the sugar and the how dry is it? So one of the interesting things that I always try to focus on when I'm approaching a new wine is not necessarily what everybody else likes to talk about, the tasting notes of black cherry and bramble and balsamic. No, I, I like to focus on what does my mouth tell me? I can feel more than I can sense the wine and be able to put the fruit words into, into articulation. <laughs> um, you know, so let's see. What's a good question that we could ask that sums everything up? Do you feel that this has a high alcohol and a high body wine? And maybe even kind of compare it to like a Pinot Noir, right? So... The color of this is a little bit darker than a lot of Pinot Noirs. But so do we get a sense of of more body and alcohol in this? No, okay, we see, I see some notes. So the beautiful thing about this wine mm. is that I feel that the oak really helps to make it so well-rounded to where the tannins are just integrated very nicely. You can feel them kind of on the back of your tongue but they're not so grippy. Um, and for especially for this price point, I think it's a fa fantastic value. But the alcohol level is so there. The Zinfandel grape comes from such hot areas, typically. And we're going to get into a little bit more onto why we see these very high alcohol levels. Um, it comes from them ripening early, and they stay on the vines a little bit longer past um, when they're, you know, in their verasion process um, and then they're picked. And so what happens is we get these sugars that build up naturally. And the more sugar you have in the wine, in the grapes, the more that you will have um, in terms of alcohol when in your final produced wine. All right. And so now 
do we get more spices or minerality? So if you get more spices, and we're talking about like uh, your baking spices, your tarragon and rosemary, um, maybe even like balsamic and olives, um, or are you getting minerality, that slate, stone, flint, and flint pebbles? Wet rock. Wet rock. So let's see if we can get a thumbs up for everybody who thinks that we get spices. Are we getting spices? I see some people are okay. getting some spice notes. Yeah. All right. Now let's see. Thumbs up for minerality. All right. We have some minerality. Yeah. Wow. All it's right. like an even split right down the middle. That's really interesting. It is. And I think it's fun to, to put it out there. And then when you see what everybody, what the professionals say the tasting notes are, um, you can kind of compare. I always like to make my own judgments first. And then I read the tasting notes and then I go back to the wine. And for me, you know, I, I, I did get some baking spices on this and some red fruits, but I didn't necessarily get a ton of cocoa, I would say. I didn't pick that up. And you go back into the glass, you give it a twirl, smell. And it kind see. of falls as it opens as well. So you may find you get notes that you didn't get earlier later on. With the Zinfandel grape too, it can and should be decanted for 30 minutes, 45 minutes. And so as we go through this lecture, feel free to put this glass down, rotate over to the next glass if you'd like, and we're gonna kind of do a little side-by-side -side comparison. So. <laughs> what is the difference between Primitivo and Zinfandel? So the reason that, you know, we have the little budding sprouts here is this is a good time to talk about clones. So these are actually both clones of a grape that comes from Croatia. And there's a lot of drama in the history of these grapes. Um, you know, Americans say this is the American grape. And then there was a lot of discussion about how oh, Primitivo, Zinfandel, and these Croatian grapes are all different. Well, it turns out after DNA testing was conducted, um, Primitivo and Zinfandel are both clones of this grape from Croatia, which means they are the same varietal. Um, but interestingly, while in Italy, they will allow producers to label Zinfandel and Primitivo um, interchangeably, in the United States, you cannot do this. You must call the clone that is Zinfandel, Zinfandel, and the clone that is Primitivo, Primitivo. So you may even find on the shelves a Primitivo Zinfandel blend, and that would be why that exists. <laughs> And that, as, um, that was jurisdiction from the TTB. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Crazy world. So, verasion is the process when a grape goes, the grape bunch, they're all little tiny green berries, and then they ripen. And you get these beautiful red skins and purple skins. Um, and you want a variety that will go through verasion at the same rate. Zinfandel is not that grape. So in one picture here, we can see the evolution of the grape to where we have still little tiny green berries, but we also have grapes that are looking almost ripe and complete. In another picture, we can really kind of see the just the, the disparity between the verasion process. And then at the very end, we even have raisins that are forming on the grapes while the rest of them look like they're ready to be harvested. And so that makes it a really difficult but interesting grape to work with. Do you pick early in the season when your acidity levels are going to be very high, but you still have a lot of green grapes on it and try to discard those little green grapes and hand pick off all the all the good berries? Or do you wait till the end of the season when that acidity level has turned to sugars and now you're going to be left with a really high alcoholic wine? Think like 15 and a half, 16 percent. Huge, huge amounts of sugar is, is produced in these in these big berries. And so. Now we're starting to see where, you know, in Lodi and other regions that are working with the Zinfandel grape, some people are trying to pick earlier, put a little bit more labor into it to separate out those green berries and try to produce a grape that has um, a little bit higher acidity just because of when you pick. So another important factor to, to think about with this is that it is a thin skin grape. So it has a lot of juice in it. You know, um, when before Robert Mondavi went down to Lodi, um, it wasn't, you know, it's in that central coast AVA where a lot of it has the reputation for being kind of bulk wine. 
Uh, it's a very fertile, uh, the valley floor kind of situation where they can grow a ton of grape volume, but it's not necessarily the greatest of interesting wines. Um, it got a reputation kind of from some major wine producers that would produce in large bulk. Uh, Robert Mandavi went down there because he was looking for a way to produce a wine as an alternative to his uh, Sonoma or Napa um, flagship brands. And the first thing that he did was lower the grape quantity that's produced from uh, 12 tons per acre to five per acre. And so just that reduction, just literally cutting off grape bunches and dropping them onto the ground is going to just concentrate that flavor. And that flavor is going to be really amazing. So what happened in Prohibition? That's on there. I think that's a beautiful picture. To me, that just sums up full. And we're, what we're talking about here is there was a little clause in Prohibition that you couldn't buy alcohol, but you could make your own for personal use. And so what they would do is they would load up the grapes onto uh, trains to ship east. So that way people could make their own grapes. But the thin skinned really didn't play well into that. They would burst halfway through. And then people started to replant with thicker skinned grapes out in uh, the California areas. So that way they would be able to sell the grapes uh, back east. They didn't know when prohibition was going to end. And so they ripped up a lot of Zinfandel in order to still have a market east. You know, another thing in the Zinfandel history, if you will, is the white Zinfandel. Now, nowadays, that doesn't necessarily fit my personal palate. Um, but there was a reason that it happened. Zinfandel wasn't super popular at the time. And, you know, one of the things that I, I love about this group that we've started here is that we can gather and learn about interesting wines and we can reflect on the pros and cons of all of the different types of varietals that we get to explore. Um, because in 1972, the reason why this grape did so well was because the population loved white wine. You couldn't produce enough white wine. But nowadays I hear so many people say, oh, I only drink red. White wine gives me a headache. It's too sweet. Uh, you know, these, these cliche, not cliche, what's a good word to the kind of go-to statements mm -hmm, that people say. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I applaud everybody who, who shows up on these, for these wine lectures, because we get to dive a little bit deeper and find the appreciation for these wines. Um, Zinfandel, being a, a prime candidate. So we're not talking about white Zinfandel today, but it is worth noting, or we're not drinking white Zinfandel, but it is worth noting because um, it helped keep the Zinfandel grapes in uh, the ground. In the ground. They were gonna rip up everything. So it actually ended up saving some of the old vines from being ripped up and planted with something else. We wouldn't have old vines in, potentially in some regions if it weren't for the white Zinfandel. <laughs> so Sutter Home, there's something good about you. <laughs> they also, a fun fact, uh, white Zinfandel still outsells red Zinfandel. So there you go. <laughs> and that's why I think we have this lecture today is to make everybody more aware that Zinfandel exists. And it's, uh, I think it's a great QPR, quality price ratio. Mm -hmm. So one thing and for all of those who attended with uh, Dr. Frank Winery, uh, we heard from Megan Frank explain the letters that her great-great-grandfather sent to UC Davis. So there was a book that was published that said uh, in, in the title, Flocks for a Resistant Rootstock, that St. George and AR, AR, AR1, AXR1, but I think everybody calls it AR1, that it is, um, that they're both flocks for a resistant. So when people were planting Pinot Noir and Cabernet Sauvignon out in the Napa Sonoma, they were using this AXR1 as opposed to St. George rootstock. And Phloxfra uh, could attack that grape. And so what ended up happening was, you know, they planted all these fields and the, the Phloxfra crippled all of the, uh, you know, the new plantings and they had to rip them all up. And so that's why when you see on the label, Old Vine Zinfandel, but you don't see Old Vine Pinot Noir or Old Vine Cabernet Sauvignon. It's because there are no old vines because of this one situation. 
So this is a picture of an old vine that exists out there. They also do say that the St. George uh, Zinfandels were growing in sandy soils, and that helps also repel out the louse. The louse, they don't like the sand. They don't like the sand. And so as we were talking about earlier from Primitivo, they used trellising in order to keep the vines a little bit higher off the ground. Um, the Zinfandel grapes are more bush style. They, they grow like this. <laughs> uh, they, they are trained in, 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 in time, if you will. And so one of the interesting things that we came across was this idea that each one of these vines is known by the field hand. It's pruned specific for what its needs are. You know, as we talked about Robert Mondavi going and lowering the, the, the quantity of grape production by half in order to make a more concentrated, uh, valuable wine, these old vines produce even one fifth of that amount. And so you get very low yields from these old vine zins, but it is a very con has a very high concentration of flavor. And the old vine is typically 40 years plus. So you can go, for instance, there can be 100 year old vines, but, but once you get to 40, if you're a grapevine, you are over the hill. Over the hill. <laughs> <laughs> Even if you're on the flatlands. <laughs> One of the kind of ideas that we came across was um, that the soil types can actually change uh, the essences of the wine. And so the sandier the soil, the more lush notes you get from it. But the more organic material, so like clay um, or seashells in some capacities, uh, would add more fragrance to the wine. And so I thought that was a really interesting thing to kind of store in the back of my head because a lot of people talk about how the soils can imp impact a terroir. And even more people, when they really get into Zinfandel, say that a plot of land that's you know, 50 yards away that has a different soil type will produce a completely different zin. And you have to approach each one with their own. Mm -hmm. So just something to keep in the back of your mind. So now we're going to move on to our low dye old vine Zinfandel. And again, we're going to do the same things. We're going to look at our fruit intensity, our tannin levels, sweetness and acidity. After all that talk about it, I'm so excited. <laughs> So I'm going to go side by side here. That's, the, I think, the... This is something that we did uh, in this whole COVID time, was how do I practice my double twirl? <laughs> I can't do it yet. <laughs> <laughs> Need more practice. It's all part of the hobby of wine explorations. If you can twirl with your left hand, yeah, you're really at an elevated level. <laughs> if the you're right-handed. If you're left-handed, you're right hand. The engineer in me really does want to get down to where I could twirl as effectively with my left hand. So that way I could do my tasting notes to my right mm -hmm. and just be very efficient when I'm in the tasting room. But then I also think, like, maybe I should slow down a little bit. I can put my time. glass down. <laughs> so, yeah, I, mm. I feel the fruit intensity is a lot higher in this, um, in the Lodi. And I think... One of the issues or one of the situations that we have is with Lodi, although it may have um, a higher diurnal. Um, OK, so a diurnal is when the for those who are attending this lecture very frequently, we talk about diurnals all the time. So I apologize. But for those who are new, diurnals are when the day is hotter and the night is colder. That delta difference. Right. And so when that delta difference is higher, you get more ripening during the day and more acidity that generates at night and it produces more complex wine. And so I use the word delta specifically here because the delta air gap is what allows the cool breeze to come in from the Pacific Ocean. And that cool breeze allows for this wonderful cool night that helps generate a really lovely acidity level. It has very high sun intensity because of where uh, Lodi is on the equator compared to Primitivo. And uh, yeah, so there's that. So in the tannin level, I definitely feel this one's a little bit more acidic. It's not as, the, the acid isn't as well, it's not that it's not as well integrated, but the, the, the mm. Primitivo, just everything feels more rustic to me and a little bit, what are mm. your thoughts? I definitely feel that I notice the acidity a little bit more in the Lodi. I think I'm getting a bit more um, 
this the I, I'm really getting um, a lot of the spices, and I'm I'm trying to place the exact spice, but there and there and there's I think the oaking notes I'm really getting a bit strong here mm -hmm. as well. Um, I do agree. I think that the primitivo, everything was very very well integrated. I think in the Lodi, I'm getting things a little bit more sequentially. Interesting. So, another graphic that we have from Wine Folly is, is an abridged version of the one that we had posted uh, into the chat at the beginning of this lecture. Um, and these tasting notes, again, really just help you kind of identify well, do I get brambles? I think I get brambles more in the Primitivo, in that rustic note, but maybe mm. spiced plums. Mmm. Mm. Spiced plum. Spiced plum. You know, yeah. I would say I do like the cinnamon note. When you were saying about mm. the spices, I felt that I got this kind of cinnamon heat. I've definitely had other wines that are more have more of that cinnamon heat in it than this, but I do feel it there, especially compared to the Primitivo. And so that's why I really like these side-by-side -side comparisons when you have a tasting wheel, because you can kind of go through and be like, well, the essence of cinnamon, which one is more represented in the, in the wine? Mm-hmm. Mm. All right, so for everybody playing at home, we're going to go one for the Lodi and two for the Primitivo. And so this is which one has more of a fragrance, like just jumping out of your glass? Which one do you feel is more aromatic? More aromatic. I'm seeing, seeing some ones. Yeah. Okay. We're seeing some ones. And yeah, I'm in camp one. Camp, camp one for that guy. one. It really does jump out of the glass. Which one is a little more jammy? So jammy versus fresh fruits is a way to think about it. Okay. So I'm going to go with two on this one just because it allows a little bit more. I think it's that sun intensity in the Primitiva that we have. Mm -hmm. um, I see some twos in the audience. Some so twos? Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Very cool. All right. So now, which one has a bigger bottle? Which one is more impressive of a bottle? The first one or the second one? So for those of you who got the wine, <laughs> the uh, the Primitivo bottle is heavy. <laughs> <laughs> when we were dragging, when we were pulling them down, you know, you can't, you have to, you can't, you know, sometimes you can hold two bottles in one hand. I'm afraid that if the Primitivo gets too close, it's just going to, beat up the the lodi bottle it's <laughs> it's impressive and they do this they do this to make the consumer feel like you're getting something impressive it really is to to make you feel that this this is a wine this it is, a, is. it's a big wine um and there is something to be said if if you don't know and you're going to a, a house party and you're handing a bottle of wine to the host and you're like thank you and they have to like catch it. I mean, that's, <laughs> you know, they're impressed with how big the bottle is. <laughs> and then this is your personal preference. Which one do you feel that you like? And I, I, I encourage everybody to look around the, the Zoom chat to see. Okay, I see, I see some ones and I see some twos. Okay, okay. A mix. A very, very stark mix. You know, right down the middle. And that's yeah. wonderful. It, it is something that is also the fact that they're known. Sometimes they're named by their style so so that it, you can identify that. If you tend to like Zinfandel, you look for that Zinfandel label. Even some Italian producers will put that on there so that you know they're making it in that style. The, the Primitivo tells you it's in the Italian style. Exactly. So. So one thing that is to really just kind of uh, make note is that the Lodi rules. And so organic is something that needs to have a following. And it's about making things sustainable, not only for the earth, but for the water. So the agriculture around it, as well as the consumer, right? Between, uh, you know, what's put into the soil and then the employees as well. And so 
it's a growing, this Lodi rules is growing in popularity and it's not as hard and fast as some of the other organic um, labels because it does take into consideration that there may be really bad vintages. And so if you have a really bad vintage and you can't do something to control pests or to increase water uh, because of the you know, biodynamic label that you're going after, you may want to have um, this instead that understands the economic needs uh, of a vineyard and controls on a more algorithmically based level. It's, it's adaptable, if you will. And they're trying to get everybody to be more organic and more sustainable and I think that's really the word. It's in the it's on the on the label, sustainable. It's not it's not about we need to be organic today. It's about we need to be sustainable for the future. And I just wanted to put it out there so that way you guys are aware of it. So if you see it on the label, you know, maybe if you have your dollars, you can vote and, and you know, vote with your dollars, if you will, and buy that bottle and support them in this. Again, we reference wine folly throughout uh, all of almost all of our lectures, and it's great to put you know, a face to a name. Uh, she's on Instagram and her stuff is amazing. And as I was trying to do the double twirl, you know, maybe one day she'll she'll throw that out there as a, a way to hold the glass. I I am I am the pinch. I like I hold it like a pencil. That's just the natural way that I I personally do it. I think I'm a standard. A standard? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, I think that's my preferred. <laughs> but everybody's a little bit different. You know, the thumb-fisted is weird because I don't know how you get out of it without having to use your other hand. Well, it's, it's, I, mean, I find it can be sometimes more fun when you're at a party and you're standing uh, up. Than yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, just a fun way to interact with wine in different ways. And so, thank you all for attending. This has been a Veni Vini Amici production. Uh, you know, on February 5th, so on Friday, we are going to be having another Italian wine sale. Um, we're going to be making a full blog that goes through uh, the full gambit of Italy wines and what we think is important. We're and make, fun. And fun. And we're <laughs> going to make a quiz about it and everything. But so the bonus and, and homework wines are going to be there. If you missed the last sale, the Chiantis, both the DOCG and the IGT, will be available at that time. On February 5th, so... In my actual day job, uh, I get to be part of the Eastern Regional Outreach for the United States Patent Office. And so my supervisor said, you love wine, you have to do IP. Why don't you run with an idea of IP and wine? And so for Black History Month, we're putting together a uh, wine and IP event where we're going to have the uh, National Council for American Innovations, uh, ex Expanding American Innovations, which is gold with trying to allow all peoples to see themselves as innovators, entrepreneurs, and inventors. And we're gonna have a conversation with some leading uh, you know, people in America that are trying to create exposure for black Americans so that way they can see themselves as wine professionals. And I think it's gonna be a great way to see what tactics they're doing to increase exposure for both you know, kind of groups of people that are underrepresented. After that, we have our, our fun lectures on March 4th with Chianti and then April 1st with our Beaujolais crew. And so with that, it concludes uh, our lecture. If you're on uh, the YouTube, like and subscribe. And for everybody else, we are going to open it up for, for chats. Yeah, so we're looking for the button. We're getting to the... Okay, we... We have ended the 